It's Cambodia's biggest export earner. A $5 billion a year industry supplying clothes and footwear to mega international brands like Adidas, H&M and Puma. It's an industry that chases after low-cost labour. Its 700,000 workers toil long hours for a minimum wage of $3 a day. Now they're demanding better conditions and better pay. I would call it as a modern day slavery. People just accept the condition because they cannot reject those conditions. With violent protests rocking the industry and the country, the government says the strikes are led by the opposition and workers are pawns in a political standoff. Both the government and the factories lost $200 million in just two weeks of strikes. The bottom line is economic justice. The bottom line is human rights, the value of our workers. We're not going to sell it cheap. This could be the garment industry's biggest test. I'm Yara Bumolham. On this edition of 101 East, we ask, will Cambodia's factory workers be fairly treated or will they continue to be fashion's victims? This is the Apsara factory on the outskirts of Cambodia's capital, Phnom Penh. It's the only one we've been given access to. Its human resources manager, Fan Sovanari, is taking me on a tour. Could you tell me how many workers you have here? We have 740 persons. 740 people. Yes. The clothes the workers in this human production line make are exported to Japan. They have to meet daily garment quotas, so they barely take a breather to tell me about working here. In other places I worked, I had to do overtime until 10 p.m. Working here is easy, not difficult. I didn't have a job. That's why I wanted to work in the factory. They're working in one of the poorest countries in the world, and they don't have many options. 80% of Cambodia's exports come from the garment industry, and it counts on cheap labour to keep it going. Too cheap, say those challenging the status quo and shedding light on the darker side of working in Cambodia's garment and footwear factories. So, Mr. Afon, is this where the protests were? Yes, so this one along this, uh, the road, is the Wayne's Lane Road, is the double military and worker are fighting together in this area. Union leader Athon spearheaded recent protests that ground the industry to a halt. This situation is like the war. One side is the, all the, the, the police military and also the force. One side is the, the worker. And some of the people, they're not happy with that. They threw the stone to the police and police shoot the, the gun to the uh, people. After two decades of relative stability, it's the first real test for the Cambodian government since the bloody civil war of the late 70s. Frustrated garment workers called for a doubling of the monthly minimum wage to $160. The government agreed to increase it slightly to $100. But there were heavy costs. The protests violently put down with scores of arrests, dozens of injuries and five people killed. I meet Prum Firom, a garment worker injured during the protests. He says he took to the streets because he was struggling to support his family. We protested because before, food, house rental and electricity was cheaper. So we could make savings of about 30 to 40 US dollars. Now we can't support our living costs and our families. The 22-year-old says police shot him as he tried to remove the dead body of another demonstrator. The police just screamed that if someone came to take the dead body, they would shoot them too. I heard three rounds of shooting. I thought the police had shot in the air. I didn't think they were shooting at us. He says it was his first protest and it's proved fateful. 
his life now, confined to the five square metres he calls home. Prum says he's had to spend $700 on treating his leg so far, about half a year's salary. Although his wound has healed, he says the bone inside is shattered and will never set. I have no hope of going back to the factory now because I'm afraid of losing my leg. This comes at a critical time for Prum and his family. His 19-month-old daughter drinks tea because they can't afford to buy milk. And another baby is due any day now. They've been relying on small donations of money and canned food, but fear that will of generosity is drying up. In the future, if I have the capital, I'll buy equipment to repair motorbikes and bicycles to support my family. But for now, when my wife and children are unhappy, I worry because I can't do anything. Union leader Athon has been campaigning to help workers like Prum get a better living wage. It doesn't take him long to draw a crowd as he talks to workers about their conditions of forced overtime and mass faintings due to overheated factories and toxic chemicals. He says a government study into living costs justifies a minimum wage of $160 a month. Without it, workers are obliged to work overtime to make up the difference. The uh, research said at least 157 to 177, so workers they need more uh, money to, uh, to uh, fill up the amount that they don't have the money. Are union demands too aggressive? They're being silly. No country in the world can double wages overnight. And to continue to insist for this is just being silly. So let them say what they want to say. Ken Liu represents almost 550 garment and footwear employers in Cambodia. He says the brands will only pass on the labour costs to the factories. The buyers have come out to say that they support the demand of the workers for a more transparent and a more predictable wage setting mechanism. It's the mechanism. They have never, never, never said they would agree to pay higher wages. If wages double, would they stop sourcing from Cambodia altogether? No. Would the, the sourcing um, decrease significantly? Yes. Lu says a minimum wage of $100 a month is reasonable. Can you survive off $100 a month? I can. They can. Why can they? Because Why is it okay for them to it's not survive? Okay. It? It's not okay, but in any country, you have the rich, you have the poor, you have those who make more money, you have those who make less. Those who make more money obviously have a different lifestyle. Those who make less may have, have to get by. I'm sure if they could, they would want to. Sure. Survive the way you survive. Sure. Sure. So strive for it. It's not guaranteed by law. Why should it be guaranteed by law? Yet for some like Chief Sarun, working a 10 to 12 hour day doesn't guarantee a better life. Sarun has been working in a garment factory for eight years. It's only recently that she's had to walk there alone. <laughs> My husband was of good character. When I wasn't feeling well, he would help with the housework. He was the kind of man who would take care of his wife. The 24-year-old takes me to where her husband, Yin Rithi, was shot during January's protests. It's just a few kilometres from the garment factory where they both worked. At around 10 a.m., he was sent from this place to the hospital. He died shortly after, the pain of her husband's death all the more bitter because she says he was an innocent bystander. Our friends were talking about the protest and said they heard the sound of shots and wanted to go and see. My husband took his motorbike and went there. I heard there were soldiers shooting randomly. 
And then suddenly, my husband was bleeding. Shot. Shot by the gun. Each week, Sarun travels back to her home village on her day off to visit her 21-month-old daughter. It's a bumpy and uncomfortable ride an hour and a half away. Around 90% of Cambodia's garment workers are female, and like Sarun, many leave their homes in the countryside for the factories in Phnom Penh and send back money to support their families. But with her husband gone, Sarun barely earns enough to feed herself. She leaves her daughter to be raised by family, but hasn't yet mustered the courage to tell her she'll never see her father again. When she asks about her father, I tell her that he has gone to Phnom Penh. Gaining closure too is difficult for Sarun. She continues going through the rituals of her daily life as she can't afford to take a break from work to grieve. It's here that Sarun finds peace, spending a few quiet moments by the remains of her 25-year-old husband. But the harsh reality of raising her child alone overwhelms her. I work hard and try my best to get her educated. I don't want my daughter to work in a factory. My life is so difficult because I'm alone. My salary is too low and I have to raise my daughter alone. It's very difficult. And every day when I go to work, I miss him. No one has been charged with her husband's death. The opposition Cambodian National Rescue Party has latched on to growing garment worker discontent. The CNRP campaigned to double the minimum wage at last year's elections. Senior opposition member Mu Sukur says her party is helping victims' families seek compensation and say they've developed enough of a case to take Cambodia's long-serving leadership to the International Criminal Court. We want to take it to the ICC. There is enough evidence going all the way back to 2002, the uh, excessive use of force, the brutal use of force. This is a system you can see, the use of the local militia with the red bands to come and destroy. Then you have the, we call them the black heads. They wear these black helmets. From here, you can't see them. They are ordered to come to crack down on any protest, aim, maim, and kill. Who would you want seen taken to The Hague? Whoever is responsible for security, whoever is responsible for the military, whoever is responsible for the police, who very openly, with no fear at all, shot at our workers, shot at our women, shot at our farmers. Government representative Chim Yip says they're investigating the violence and deaths, but accuses the opposition of instigating the protests. When the opposition lost the election, they tried every means to convince people to protest. The opposition and the unions blame the government. They, they say that the military police used excessive force that led to deaths. The police needed to defend themselves. The protesters had Molotov cocktails, slingshots with metal balls, sticks and stones. It was a violent protest from workers that were led by the CNRP. But Cambodia's opposition says its methods are non-violent. It's been boycotting Parliament, calling last year's elections, which kept Prime Minister Hun Sen in power, a sham. And it likens the current protests to those that swept the Arab world in 2011. There is a Cambodian spring. You have the people who say justice, non-violence and peace, and then you have Mr Hun Sen, who's been in power for over 30 years, and say, I can't negotiate. 
I can only negotiate with you with the barrel of the gun. No. All people deserve better. The opposition party boycotted joining the National Assembly. So they protest against us because they see and follow the examples of neighboring countries like Thailand, Ukraine and Egypt or Tunisia. They follow all those countries but the situation in Cambodia is not like that. Does the government agree that this could mark the end of Prime Minister Hun Sen's 30-year career? Prime Minister Hun Sen has been Prime Minister for 32 years by general election. He didn't become Prime Minister on his own. This is Sahanaville, a popular tourist destination and home to Cambodia's largest port. Most of the country's $5 billion in garment and textile exports pass through here. And while this draws investors and buyers from around the world, some of its factories continue to flout the law despite repeated warnings. I meet two sisters who work in a Sahanaville shoe factory. I can't reveal their identities as they're afraid they'll lose their jobs. I'll call the youngest Neri. Was it easy to get the job? I just used my sister's birth certificate. So there's two people in the factory working under the same name? Yes, the same name. Neri is only 13 years old. She tells me she punches holes into leather in the New Star Shoe Factory, a supplier to Japanese global brand ASICS. Do you think that the factory knows that your sister is underage? Maybe they know, because when a guest comes, they always ask her to go to the bathroom. Have you ever been told to hide or stay at home by the factory? When a visitor comes, my supervisor asks me to go to the bathroom, because they don't want me to be seen. Well, why do you think they would tell you to hide? Because I'm too young, they don't want them to see me, and maybe they will ask me to go to school. The sisters come from a poor farming family in a rural province and only completed a primary school education. I feel upset because I cannot earn enough money. I feel like crying and I don't want my sister to come to work because I want her to study. Every holiday I let her visit home because she always misses home and my parents more than I do. Yes, I miss my parents. I've always missed them since I started working here. The minimum working age in the garment and footwear industry is 15. Al Jazeera has independently verified that Neri is 13 years old. She says she works 10 to 16 hour days. That completely dangerous. Um, the girls still need time, I mean, uh, in the young age like this, they need time to sleep more in order to gain physical uh, development and also the uh, mental development. Muwan Tula is an activist with a legal advocacy group. He's been investigating underage workers at the New Star factory for almost three years. We asked them why uh, underage uh, employed uh, in the factory. They said one is the need of the family to get income to support their family. Another thing, the, 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 the management also prefer using sh uh, underage people because those people don't make, make complain, they just do what you, you, you require them to do. Muan Tula goes house to house to educate workers about their rights and to investigate factory malpractice. Today, he's speaking to New Star factory workers who say some of their co-workers are as young as 10. Wow. It's something that could happen, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And, and if indeed it happens, then it goes to show intention, or at least the fact that they are aware uh, of, of um, 
their workers being underage, you know, and intentionally allowing it. Mu and Tula and I head to Newstar. We're going to try to approach the factory owners to see if they'll verify what we found about underage workers here. Can you give us the number of the manager? So uh, we are not allowed to take photo. The security guard is asking us to leave, but we're still trying to find someone to speak to who would have the authority to tell us something about underage workers here. He said uh, he suggests us to take a uh, film or film from Brisbane. Uh, Not at the gate. He has a problem. Finally, we get a number for the security manager. Hi, this is Yara from Al Jazeera English. Is it possible to speak with a representative of Newstar about allegations we have about underage workers? Uh, you can ask the security to search for the uh, admin. He passes us on to the administration department. So there is no someone inside. There's no, the there's no one in admin. Yeah. No one's picking up. We're being given the runaround and shuffled from one department to the next. Nobody wants to talk to us, so it doesn't seem like we're going to get any answers today from the New Star factory. I think they, there's some overlap in ownership. New Star joined the UN Better Factories Cambodia program in January, which monitors factories' working conditions. The threat of, of public exposure has motivated factories that were you know, we're, we're, didn't have their eye on these issues before. Just Jason Judd manages the audit process and tells me that this month marks the first time in over a decade that the program is releasing its findings. Previously, only factory owners and the brands that source from them would see the reports. You can see that we've been in some of these factories six and eight and ten times over the last decade. Our recommendations, these, these legal requirements under the law, are not, uh, are not news to these guys. Yeah, they know that they haven't been complying, but they haven't done anything about it. Do you think that this transparency report will push them to change? Yeah, we, I mean, we, we know they're feeling the pressure. A good number of these factories have called us to at last get clear about what the legal requirements are, what they've got to do to come into compliance, and, and that's the dynamic that we want. This has is, this is forced these factories to make improvements, and, and that's good for workers. Judd says that they have yet to publish the New Star assessment report, but that child labour is something that is taken very seriously. It's such a sensitive issue that when we find it, we move immediately to get the factory to, uh, to deal with it. And that when we brought this to the attention of management, they moved right away to remedy the problem, to get those workers out of the factory, continue to pay their wages, put them into school or a training program. That's what we want. We want a factory to respond by fixing the problem. The reports are given to the buyers. The new staff factory is a member of the Garment Manufacturers Association. We've received allegations that new staff shoes hires underage workers. What's the next step? We would talk to the management and get them to, to stop. We would ensure that you know they go through the same remediation process that uh, we have in agreement with BFC. In a statement to Al Jazeera, one of the New Star factory buyers, ASIC, says, "We understand that New Star has employed some underage workers." And a spokesperson from New Star says it has taken action to provide schooling to the identified underage workers. Following Al Jazeera's investigation. Neri and at least 80 others have been identified as underage workers by Newstar. Their employment has been terminated, but they were offered paid tuition classes. Neri declined and has gone back home to help on her family's farm. Prum no longer sees a future for himself in the garment industry, but he says he won't give up fighting for the factory workers. I've committed that if in future there's another protest, I will join again. For Sarun, she says she will seek justice and compensation for her husband's death and continue to support her daughter alone. I pray and want to work hard until my daughter grows up so that she can go to school. All agree that Cambodia relies heavily on an industry that depends on low-cost labour to produce the world's fashion. But with the opposition and workers vowing to labour for a better wage, the challenge now is to strike a balance that sees all profit.